Hi everyone. If you are logged on to the webinar, we will be starting in just about five minutes.
Hi, everyone, and welcome to the HIPAC LIDAR payload webinar. My name is Brittany Hines, Marketing Specialist here at HIPAC, and I will be your host for today's presentation. Before we begin, I want to remind you about the question box on the side of your screen. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so please submit them there using the question dropdown. So for today's webinar, we're going to take a, a more in-depth look at the HIPAC LIDAR payload and how it can better your survey work. I would now like to introduce to you our presenter for today, Jerry Nicely, who is our technology manager here at HIPAC. We are so happy to have him here today with us to talk more about this solution. So with that, I'm going to turn over the presentation to Mr. Jerry Nicely. Thank you, Brittany. So this is another one of our webinars about the HIPAC LiDAR payload. We've had a couple in the past, and today we're gonna to talk about some of the changes to the LiDAR payload. So the first thing we're gonna do in our objectives, we're gonna talk about LiDAR data collection, processing your LiDAR data points, generating an LAS file. For those of you that deal with LiDAR, LAS is the format of choice that a lot of people like to use. Exporting your data from HIPAC to ESRI. We have a new collaboration with ESRI that we're gonna talk about. And then plan future development. We've got it in our roadmap to make some changes to our LiDAR data processing. Specifically this morning, we're gonna talk about our uh, the HIPAC payload. The HIPAC payload, <clears throat> let's go meet it. The HIPAC payload includes a VLP-16, and the VLP-16 LiDAR unit is on the front of our payload. The Ellipse-2G is the IMU and GPS internal. It also includes a Windows I Intel i7 computer with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a battery. Internal to the whole thing, you get all the parts you need to go collect the data. The battery is good for about two to two and a half hours once it's fully charged. The arms are extendable and they lock into place. On the back of the LiDAR payload, we have the different ports that are available. There's a USB port that goes directly to the computer, the power charging port, the power switch, which we're gonna talk about was changed from a rocker switch to a depressed switch with a, a lightable ring to let us know that the payload is actually energized. The ethernet port on the back so you can talk to the computer through another computer and remote desktop and the VLP 16 connection. When I'm working on the computer, a lot of times I'll be calibrating it or doing something on the a table outside getting ready to go work. I'll disconnect the VLP 16 connection so that the actual unit doesn't use the battery to run the LiDAR when it doesn't need to. So some of the improvements over the last year of building the LiDAR units, we've changed the to a double C clamp sliding hinge on those arms. When we talk about the arms on the top of that hinge, you'll notice is an Allen wrench screw. That screw allows us to tighten this clamp down in place and provide more rigidity to those GPS arms. When you put it on a boat or you put it on a drone, sometimes you'll get some vibration in the antenna arms. So there's a triangle arm joint. If we go back up a couple slides, you can see the triangle arm joint and it has the grenade pin on the bottom. There's a hole within that arm. As you open the arms up, it locks. And then you tighten down the Allen screw on the top and it gives you that extra sense of rigidity that's gonna be beneficial when you're in a higher vibration environment. Something else we've done is we've taken the drone mount connectors and put them on top. Before you used to have to take the top plate off of the payload so you could mount it to a drone, you'd have to put these little clamps on. The new drone mounting hardware is easy to detach from the payload when it's not required. It's just a Phillips head screwdriver from the top. They unscrew or screw back down. The new structure is top mounted so that it's easier to use. There's only four handles or four arms that connect to the rods on your drone. We use a DJI Matrice 600. There's several other drones that the same clamps will work with. There's a underhanging rail that's pretty common with most drones. Um, standard width and diameter so that you can connect to those. On the back, we have the new power switch that I started to talk about a couple minutes ago or a minute ago. It prevents accidental powering on or off of a unit. What we noticed was the rocker switch might get pressed when you lower the unit down into the Pelican case and put it away and it would discharge your battery when you were storing it or you'd get it nice and aligned and everything and you pick it up to move it and you'd hit that rocker switch. The new switch is a glow ring that provides positive indication the payload's energized. So you press that switch down and you'll get a nice green glow to that, which was in the other screen. On the bottom left and right are the antenna connectors. You don't take these out. They're actually gland seal nuts. 
so that the wire is contiguous from the antenna into the SBG unit. And that way we don't have any breaks that can cause impedance problems or antenna fluctuations. So those would be your antennas. On the top right in this image, you can see the Velodyne connector is disconnected so that it's not charging the battery. It's just a rendition here. So first thing, let's talk about some LiDAR data collection. When we start talking about LiDAR data collection, one of the things I like to discuss is beam divergence. So this describes the change in diameter from a laser. Everyone thinks a laser is a pinpoint light that goes out forever. In reality, it's just like a sonar transducer. It gets wider as it gets further away from the source. So here we have an image of the laser and the laser shoots out and it gets bigger where you see the D to the right in this image. One of the reasons that I bring this up when we talk about the payload is managing expectations of what you're going to get. There are some positives and negatives to everything. In this case, we're gonna discuss in a second some of the positives that come with a larger beam footprint and some of the negatives. Large footprint versus small footprint. So at 50 feet, in the image to the right, what you're looking at is a car. We've had a LiDAR system loaded up on a car. We were driving along and we scanned some rocks. At 50 feet, the beam footprint for the Velodyne unit is 1.8 inches. Now there's 16 beams. You can see all the beams fanning out away from the car. 16 of those happen simultaneously. And each one of those beams has a 1.8 inch footprint at 50 feet. At 100 feet, it's three and a half inches. At 150 feet, it's five and a half inches. The Velodyne VLP-16 has a larger footprint than some other LIDARs that are in our, our general market. What it does though, is it'll detect small objects better, small thin objects like a power line. You'll get more information, you'll collect more of that data than you would if you had a small LIDAR footprint. One of some of the more expensive LIDAR units are gonna give you a better resolution to your target, a more distinctive return, but it's not going to give you small objects because you might miss those during the rotation of the laser system. So that's one of the reasons the large footprint benefits us. Another thing that benefits us when, if you imagine you're flying your drone at that 100 to 150 foot vertical off the ground, typically I try to fly around 100 feet off the ground, a little higher if there's some trees, that three and a half inch diameter, the footprint that it sees, think of it like a dinner plate that's going through and getting bigger as it goes away from the laser, it will detect the leaves of a tree. So if you're flying above some canopy, you'll actually be able to hit a tree branch and get a return beyond that tree branch or that leaf. When we talk about doing lasers, a lot of what people are looking for is the actual true ground elevations, a DTM without vegetation. So if we do this and we run this at 150 feet, what you're gonna notice is it will actually detect the branch or the leaves and it will detect the ground behind it. With a smaller footprint, you're gonna detect the branch or the leaves, but you're not gonna get the true ground below it. So you won't be able to use vegetation filters to clean that data out. Something I like to talk about even before we talk about the LiDAR system, the payload, because this is inherent to all LiDAR systems. Any system, whether it's on a boat or drone, um, any other laser scanners that you might be looking at or using, this is something to be aware of. So this question has come up extensively since the first version of the HIPAC payload was built. Um, originally it was built so that you use the LiDAR payload with an internet connection and end trip corrections for GPS. That was our design. We purposely did not embed a radio receiver for RTK based corrections. The weight is already almost 10 pounds. You have to have an extra connector. The unit is IP67 rated. So every hole penetration that we have into the box is gonna cause issues that you have to be concerned about. So what we've done is we've worked with our sales team and they've settled on the SATEL radio. In the picture you can see on the RTK base station is the SATEL radio transmitter, goes up to the antenna, transmits its signal to the SATEL receiver on board our payload. The SATEL receiver has a nine pin serial connection on the back of it that goes into a USB to serial connector. Now, the reason we do this is we have the i7 computer inside the computer or inside the payload and that computer is talking to the aux port of the SPG. We don't have the SPG's aux port directly out the back of the, the payload, just like I was saying. 
not having a radio, not having the serial port come out, helps us with the IP67 waterproof or uh, certification. So in our case, we'd have a base station connected to the SATEL radio that transmits to the SATEL receiver. The SATEL receiver connects to a USB to serial device, comes into the computer. And on the bottom, what you can see is the USB serial device comes in, we run a program called Input Echo. Input Echo takes that serial input and it puts it out on a serial port to the SPG. It's the same serial port that we would be using the NTRIP corrections to. This allows us to send the data from the radio through the USB connection into the program, route it back out to the SPG and provide the corrections the SPG needs to be in RTK mode. If you didn't use the SATEL radios. I've also done it with RFD 900 radios, which are drone specific radios that we use. With the drone specific radios, it has a USB connection on it, so I don't need that extra device. I plug a USB RFD 900 into my laptop, connect the GNSS radio or the Favor or the Fever, however you pronounce that software, where I go out, get my end trip corrections, send it out a serial port into the RFD 900. I have an RFD 900 receiver on the payload that takes that signal in and does the same thing as the bottom. It routes it through input echo and sends it into my SPG. So if you don't have an internet connection on your payload, you can actually use these RFD 900 radios, which are relatively inexpensive, run NTRIP on your laptop, broadcast the corrections into the payload that way. It works very well. We use input echo for a couple other things. The SPG connection, we run a version of input echo where we, we read from the input echo or in from the SPG into input echo and we save the, the binary data that the SPG sends us that we need for Kinertia post-processing. We've done several projects now over the last six months where people have taken a payload, put it on a boat, carried it in hand, walked around with it and had no RTK corrections whatsoever, collected the data they needed, you wait a couple days for the satellite data to be downloaded from the internet. You run Kinertia, and Kinertia allows you to apply an RTK or create a POSPAC file that we can then, or Kinertia output file, but it's the same as a POSPAC file, that we can read in post-processing into our data and provide an RTK correction. So RTK, there's several ways to get there. We have tested this SATEL radio system. We know how to make it work. We also, the NTRIP is something we've been doing for over a year, and I've done the RFD 900 for a while now testing the system. So if you have any questions about it, please contact the support team or contact me directly. Now, so much more than a drone LIDAR. Our first foray into this was to put a Velodyne inside a drone with an SBG inside a drone, and it was all tied heavily to the drone. Notice how I keep saying drone. In this image, multiple images here, you can see in the top left, we have a university down south that did some beach erosion work in Myrtle Beach, and they put it on an I-beam on an ATV and they drove around and they collected data. And it was really interesting because they did a beach survey before and after a hurricane to see the dune, the damage to the dunes and the LIDAR was integral to that. They used the TIN model program to do change detection over time, worked great. In the middle, we have the drone mounted to a DJI 600 Pro. That drone, we have one here. We went up, there was a landslide up in Maine. We were able to fly the drone with a payload and collect data over the area of damage. Worked really well. It has the same little feet or fingers on the top that I talked about. You can see in the university's image, those are connected to the rails underneath. On the top right image I did last week, we did with a high cap. I went up to Fall River, we mounted this with some of our Xylem partners over at ISS, put a payload on top of a HiCat, and then used the HiCat as the vessel of mobility and drove around and collected a bunch of data with the LiDAR system, independent of what the HiCat was doing. It didn't change the buoyancy greatly, um, was able to carry the drone everywhere we wanted in a remote control fashion. In the bottom left, we did some river crossing work recently where we had to do about a mile and it crossed some streams and it was a right away. We put the payload in a wagon that we bought at Home Depot, put a, the Pelican case the payload comes into and the payload on it with some bungee straps or ratchet straps, tied it down. And we were able to walk 
over a mile with the system and just collect all the data there and back, processed it, did RTK post process and it looked great. In the middle screen on the bottom, you'll notice that it's on top of a car. So this is how I calibrate the system. I mount it to the top of the car, the Velodyne's pointed aft like it would be on a boat. And then I have a Panasonic Toughbook inside where I can see what the, the computer sees. And we go over to the Walmart parking lot and we drive around a light tower that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Every unit comes calibrated and it's pre-calibrated here. We use grid convergence we'll talk about shortly where grid convergence is the difference between true north and the grid north. And as you calibrate the system here in Connecticut, and then I send it off to Florida or somewhere else, the grid convergence changes, but there's a checkbox within HIPAC to handle that. In the bottom right, when we were up in Maine, we had to calibrate the unit. We wanted to check our calibration from Connecticut. We drove to Maine, so we were checking it. You'll see my boss, Garrett, is down there pushing a stroller or cart. We put the Pelican case in there, and it's just any configuration you can think of, you can collect data with this. We've put it into a little baby carrier and walked around collecting data with it. It's pretty resourceful in the ways that you can actually collect data. The point is, it's so much more than a drone LIDAR. Everyone talks about it. We want to make sure you know you can do this without being in a drone. All right. So our next display is our survey display windows. This is where rubber meets the road. This is when you're collecting data. And this is the part that you really care about. We've made this a very simple system to use to collect data. Once it's set up in the HIPAC hardware, you go into survey, it launches the high sweep survey and the survey program together. On the top right, what you're looking at is the HIPAC real-time cloud. And the data in this was collected in Colombia by Carlos. You'll notice in the top right, that's a real-time image, not post-processed, not cleaned up. That's what the drone or the payload, in this case, it wasn't on the drone, it was on the back of a truck. That's what the payload's actually seeing. In our real-time cloud, you can see I've got a 747 in there as my boat. I don't know if you can see the little red airplane in there. We can do a bunch with 3D shape objects, which is pretty nice in there for display purposes. But we collected the data, or in this case, Carlos collected the data around a mall and through a town. On the bottom, you'll see the topographic laser window. That's the black window to the bottom in the middle of the screen. That window is similar to a beam profile that you would look at for a multi-beam while you're collecting data. It's a visual representation of one sample of data. And because the way the Velodyne feeds data to us, you see a little bit of data, it'll, it'll jump around in that window, but you'll notice that you're getting the scans of data and that's where we reference it. I just happened to take this screen capture just at the beginning of a cycle, so not all the data points are filled in. The bottom right, we have our high sweep survey window. And one of the reasons I like to highlight this, it's a QC window as you're collecting data. You see NAV, uh, gyro, MRU, and multi-beam. In this case, the Velodyne is the multi-beam and side scan. All of them are green except for side scan. Side scan's red because obviously we're above ground. We're not using a side scan system. So it's a visual indicator to the user, something's wrong. Well, in this case, everything's right because I expect side scan to be red. I can acknowledge that, but I didn't for this display purpose. That way you see what you're getting and you see the display of what's happening. Now, the whole left half side of this screen is the actual HIPAC survey program. That's the part where you see where you're at. There's a map in there and we're filling a matrix to give us a coverage idea of where we've got data. Real-time cloud can be used as a QC monitor, just like the matrix can be used as a QC monitor. You'll notice in the data, it's colorized, and these are on one meter grids. These are one meter cells. So each one of the little squares that make up that display, you can see some of the spurious cells off to the right. Each one of those is one meter in square. That's where returns have been collected. You'll notice that it's yellow along the sidewalk, it's green where the road is, and then the trees and the building structures are all red. So it gives me a visual indication that I'm getting pretty good data. If I had a roll issue or something was going on with my data, you'd notice that it would change color throughout that data set. So in this case, the buildings are lining up really well with the aerial photograph that they downloaded so that they could see where they were going and which roads they were on. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about LiDAR processing. So in LiDAR processing, LiDAR data collection, if you have questions, please contact us. But LiDAR processing is where it's at. 
LiDAR data is typically a lot cleaner than multi-beam data. So the first thing you have to do is a patch test. And this is what I do here in Connecticut. <coughs> Excuse me. Every LiDAR payload is patch tested, calibrated here before we ship it. We use that grid convergence option that I was talking about so that when you get it, as long as it stays checked, the software is smart enough to know true north versus grid north and makes the alignment correction so you don't have to repatch test. If that wasn't the case, or if you notice that there's a difference in your yaw value, that's where it could be in the grid convergence. If you have unchecked that box or you brought it onto a computer to process it where the box wasn't checked originally, you'll notice that you have a yaw error and it can be as simple as checking that box. Joe Burnett showed me that and beats it into me every time I forget and ask him for help because he's like, did you check grid convergence? All right, going into the patch test. One of the really exciting things that happened this year for our software was our programmer, Mike Kalmbach, Joe was up here, we were doing some patch test calibrations on some of these payloads, and Mike was able to add the bottom right manual patch test adjustments. When you do a patch test, the first thing you do is the automated patch test. So you collect data in four different directions around a light tower. So you go, if you have a light tower, we go to Walmart because it's convenient, it's only a five minute drive for us. We drive around this thing counterclockwise, starting and stopping, driving straight lines on each side. So you go north, then you go east, then you go south, then you go west, and something along that. You collect your data. You'll notice on the right-hand side, I've got it colored by file. There's red, there's green, there's yellow, there's purple in that white tower. All four passes are representative in that data set. So what Mike added, after you do your automated patch test to get you really close, on the bottom right in the cloud pop-up window, you can drag a box around your window and it actually pops up in a 3D display. We're looking at it in 2D right now from the top down. So we're looking at it so that you're looking directly above it, looking towards the ground. In this window, I have a nice round circle for the base of my light tower. When Joe was up here last and he was helping me calibrate some of these things, he showed me you delete all of the top of the light tower. And when you delete the top of the light tower, you're left with that nice round base to do your patch test on. I was always trying to line up all the things at the top. But if you do it on the bottom, you'll get a nice round circle like that. Then you undelete those points. and Wow, you've got a really nice patch test of a light tower. In the bottom right, that manual patch test adjustments that Mike added is awesome. Because once the patch test gets me close, you'll notice on the bottom left, it says step. I can adjust that step to anything I want, 0 0.01, 0 0.1 in this case. And then to the right, there's pitch, roll, and yaw. And you can see below those values what we started with and what we ended with. And if I went and clicked the up or down arrow on pitch, roll, or yaw, it makes the adjustment just like the patch test would do. But visually in the 3D window, it applies the adjustment so I can watch as that value comes closer together and I get that nice round ring, the yellow and the red and the green, give me that nice round circular object that I'm trying to find, those are really nice. And then on the bottom, if you hit adjust, you'll also have a test okay button to the right. If you hit test okay, it applies to the rest of your survey. So while you're doing this, it only applies to the window you're looking at unless you hit test okay. To turn this on when you're in MB Max 64 and High Pack 2021, the top right there's a checkbox for calibration. If you check that box, you get that menu at the bottom. Something that we've added this year. All right, LiDAR data sets, the amount of processed data points. So we process our LiDAR data in MB Max 64. It's the same software that we use for our multi beam, it handles the best data that we can process. What you can see here is this was six lines of LiDAR data. This was collected by Carlos, our sales manager down in South America, and he collected it in 22 minutes in an urban environment from a pickup truck. So back when I was showing you that real-time survey window that this is the same data set that Carlos collected, it turns out that in 22 minutes of data, Carlos collected 163 million data points. 
And we have all these conversations at HIPAC about large data sets and how do we handle bigger and bigger data sets. It's because your sensors nowadays are collecting ridiculous amounts of data. We collect so much more data than we did 20 years ago when I started here. This data sets 163 million data points. It was collected over 22 minutes. I opened it up, ran some filters, saved it. Then I reopened my edited data, which is now in a binary format. And it took 35 seconds for me to load up 163 million data points. Let that sink in for a minute. 35 seconds, we loaded 163 million data points. Just imagine how powerful the software has got to be. 163 million data points are roughly 123,900 data points per second. Those data points per second, even though the Velodyne can collect 300,000 data points a second, we didn't get that because the Velodyne is sampling 360 degrees. So some of the data points that it would have tried to collect are in space, straight up above us. And if you're not under a canopy, it's not going to collect a full 300,000 data points. 123,900 are true actual object data points, not theoretical samples. So 123,000 to me was pretty impressive per second as that rotates. Let's talk about my favorite way to edit the data. When I edit the data, I edit it in a cloud window. So when I'm processing LiDAR data, I don't use the sweep window as much. Um, I use the profile later. But what I like about the cloud window You'll notice in the background, we have MBMAC 64, half red and half green. In there, you have these cloud sections, which are the squares. They're 100 foot by 100 foot squares that I've just set up user controlled size. And on the right in the cloud window is the data for the cell where you see my white crosshairs in the middle. That's the data for that section. I can go in and clean up the data in the cloud window in 3D, process it, Above the black area where you see the data points is a green checkbox. There's an up and down arrow in the middle is a green checkbox. If I check that section, it turns green on the map in the background. Every one of our editing windows, the sweep window, the profile window, the cloud window, all have that checkbox. You'll also notice that on the top in the MBMAX 64 window is a green checkbox. That green checkbox lets us go in there and check a cell and say, okay, here we go this is our data at this point, it's good. What's nice about that is if I exit out of the software, that section stays. If I save my session, someone else comes along and picks it up, they see where I edited my data. It's nice to have that ability. So using the cloud window and the check beams allows the user to visually see where they've stored or edited their data. It's a really cool tool that not a lot of people know about. And for editing cloud data or editing LiDAR data, you're able to edit in 3D which to me lets you process more data quickly and helps out in the long run. So once I've done my calibration, we'll go back to here, we can save a calibration file. It's called a boat file to us. And you go down at the bottom right of the window, you'll see in the read parameters, you can save or load a boat file. This is Carlos's unit because I calibrated his unit before I shipped it to him, so I have a calibration file. When I load data from his unit, You'll notice it loads the patch test values in the middle, yaw, pitch, and roll for my Velodyne. It also uh, sets my offsets. So if my Velodyne offsets were mistaken, if somebody went in there and changed them, I can use this boat file to actually get my data into the system and then process it that way. It's a very handy and very useful way to store your offsets, especially if somebody else is gonna be messing with your payload or I store one, and if you have a payload, you can always call up and I can send you the boat file for your unit from here in Connecticut. So let's talk about LAS formats. We talked about this being the format in the beginning of the uh, high pack output. LAS is a standard format that people use with LiDAR data. Saving an LAS file. The MBMAC64 editor allows you to save an LAS file with one point per cell. What that means is when you're processing and you see in the map in the background, we have a 0.3 by 0.3 meter grid going on. So we're about a one foot squares. I can save this as one point per cell. That's gonna not show as much of the vertical structure because I can choose median, min, max, um, any one of the values for that cell. But if I save one point per cell, it's gonna reduce the amount of data I'm trying to put out. 
remember this is 163 million data points. With 163 million data points, it's just a lot of information that we've got to process. I typically save it all as all my data points in an LAS format. We also can save it in Hypax proprietary format. We can save it as an XYZ file with or without intensity. When you bring it up in the cloud program, I recommend saving it as XYZ with intensity. It gives you a, a nice way to look at things. Um, you can see paint stripes or markings on the ground. Other things pop out at you when you use the intensity values. LAS is the standard format that a lot of people use. So we have that in our software that it's able to be brought out. Now, ESRI output for LiDAR data. ESRI ArcGIS is something that we've been around for years and with Xylem's uh, integration, Xylem has a partnership with ESRI that we've been able to draw upon to help us get the tools we need to output high pack data. We want it to be an easy button. So what we've done is right in the high pack shell, you have the ability to export XYZ data from our software into an ArcGIS database. So you have ArcGIS with a geo database and you put in there the ArcGIS data. I want to create a feature class within my ArcGIS data set in ArcGIS. Then I go into high pack in the shell. I save out from MBMAX64 an XYZ file, right click on it and tell it that I want to export it to the geo database. And it asks me which feature class do you want? I can save the symmetry to the database. I can save LiDAR data to the database. I can do a lot of different things there, but the class has to be set up in ArcGIS. You can do that from the shell. You can also do that from the cloud program in HiPAC 2021. If you load it up in cloud, you can go in and tell it that you want to export that data. You can edit in 3D in the cloud program and save it out to your ArcGIS database. Once it's in ArcGIS, you have the full power of ArcGIS. ArcGIS has so many tools. If you haven't been there, go look at their website of all the different things that they can do. They can do instantaneous raster calibration values. They can do uh, volumes. They can do a lot of different things with your data once it's there. We export our data out. It goes right into the geo database. You'll notice on the left, monumental LAS is my file. That's the file that I exported from HiPAC and put into ArcGIS. Once it's in ArcGIS, in this case, it's showing me a surface and it shows you the, the symbology to the right is breaking down, broken down by the color schemes. It gives you the amount of area. It gives you the min and the max values. There's a bunch of things that ArcGIS can do. You get the full power of their software right within their the ability to run their software. So plan future development. So we've got a lot of stuff in our roadmap. Obviously, LiDAR is something that we're trying to, to provide better tools. We've enhanced a lot of the things within the last year. One of the things we want to do is classification of LiDAR data points. So here we see our cloud program. Um, I've got a small section around our building loaded right here. Obviously, I scan our building a lot, just playing around with these things. And I selected the power lines. And the red dots are all the power lines I selected. Future development, we're going to give the tool in here that you can select these data points and then click an icon and go to classify. And we're gonna use all of the standard LAS format classifications. There's power lines, there's roads, there's structures, there's buildings, there's a lot of trees. There's a lot of things you can select and say, this is what I want. I want you to know this is a, a tree. And then when we go back a couple slides and look in here, you, you would have under the LAS file on the left, you would have all of the different structures and all of the different classifications where you could, you'll notice at the top, it says classification. You could turn off everything except for trees or show me all the buildings. Or you could do an area, like show me all the buildings and give me the area of all the buildings in, the, in this data set. There's a lot of different things that you can do once you have the data classified that HiPAC currently doesn't have a classification tool that we're gonna work towards. So that's our future development. We're also working towards a couple other of the LiDAR tests and different systems that we're integrating. But I think at this point, we're done with the presentation, Brittany. 
Thank you, Jerry. That was a great presentation. Uh, we're now going to move on to the Q&A section of the webinar. So we hope that you stick around for this section. Um, but if you're unable to, we want to thank you for uh, joining us today. And we hope to connect with you in the near future about the HiPAC LiDAR payload solution. So go ahead, Jerry. Let's answer a few questions. All right. So I see here our first question is, how can we see the data in real time when using the payload through the drone? If the drone's in the air, there's a couple different things we can do. This drone doesn't have a long range Wi-Fi embedded in it, similar to our other drone. If you're connected to the internet, a lot of times when I fly the drone, I have a MiFi at five gigahertz that's wired through the USB port into the drone so that I can see the drone over a team viewer or one of the uh, connections that way. If it's on a drone, that's, in my case, when I fly the drone right now, I don't watch it real time. I get it calibrated, I get it aligned, I plug into it on the ground, I log in and tell it to start logging with a five minute log backup time, which with a five minute log backup time, every five minutes it starts and stops a file. I make sure I've got a five second overlap so I have no gaps. For me, ground to ground, I don't care what the drone sees or what it does. I hope that I'm collecting good data. I don't make real time decisions in the air about coming back. We've had a couple situations where we were flying a drone and wind hit us and we had a really strong roll and the drone corrected itself and completed the mission. And I just cut out the bad data when it lands. It's just, there's too many things to worry about when you have a drone in the air and look at the drone pilots not capable, in my opinion, of paying attention to what's going on with the computer and what's going on with the drone. So you can see it through one of those versions or there's a couple other Wi-Fi things you can adapt to it that we don't recommend. Fly it, collect your data and land it. The drone's in the air 15 minutes. The cost benefit for me is if I got a, if it didn't collect what I wanted, I'll check it out when it's on the ground and I'll fly another mission. I'd rather fly another mission than make a decision that's going to cause a problem when it's in the air. I hope that answered your question. The Z reference value when using the payload for PPK processing through Kinertia, the SBG is your Z value reference. So all of the offsets in HiPAC are from the SBG. And we did that specifically for this question. The Z reference value when using the payload for PPK processing through Kinertia. We want Kinertia not to know that it's on a drone. We want the SBG in Kinertia to be the primary thing, what it matters, who cares. We care about the, the SBG. And if we offset everything to the Velodyne, when you ran Kinertia, you would have to offset everything to the Velodyne. You'd have to put in those lever arms to figure out where the VOP was. By using the reference point on the SBG, you can leave everything zero in Kinertia except for your lever arms to your antennas. And that POSPAC file will be correct when it goes into HiPAC because all of your offsets to the Velodyne are in HiPAC. I hope that answered your question. We tried to make it as simple and as clean as we could. And then our next question is, how the SATEL radio can be mounted on payload and using it through the drone? We put the SATEL radio when we did it I used double sticky back tape because there's no screw mounts and mounted it to the bottom of the payload. And I got a 90 degree antenna uh, connector, screwed it into the, the box and ran the antenna straight down so that it was stuck to the bottom of the payload. Um, we don't have any permanent fixture marks on there because we don't know which radio you're gonna use. There's some double sticky back tape that I got at Home Depot that I guarantee it's a screwdriver to pry it apart once you're done. That's how we mounted it on ours. And export extensions, I'm not sure what that question's about. Um, maybe from somebody, if Brittany, we can find out who that was, I'll send them an email. The Ultra Puck Scanner, the next question, can the payload be installed with the Velodyne Ultra Puck Scanner? Um, we haven't tried that and we haven't adapted the payload to anything other than the VOPs that we have on it. Um, the Ultra Puck gives you better range and better resolution, I believe. We would have to talk about that in the future and have one of those. It would have to be a retrofit, I believe. Um, the Cloud Editor, it's a major, it's okay. Um, they're asking me to show something. So if I go in here, 
Um, we'll go to the next question first. How do you confirm time synchronization between LIDAR and the position motion? So if you go into the payload, and I don't have a screen capture of this, and I don't have a payload turned on, if you go into the payload, you'll go to the Velodyne web page. It's 192.168.0.201, I believe it is, for the, the actual web browser of the Velodyne. On the bottom of that screen, you'll see a position, a GPS message that's changing, and to the right of that, it'll have PPS lock. Those two are your indication that the Velodyne is time synced properly. The Velodyne gets its time from the SBG, and that's how we time sync it. You'll, we send an RMC message and a PPS pulse, and if you're concerned about time syncing, you can check those two places within the software. On the Velodyne itself, will actually show you um, the positional change, and you'll also see that you have PPS locked. All right, so my last question. We have not integrated an RGB camera with the payload for a drone. If you have an RGB camera that you want to integrate to the payload, we'd have to run it in through the USB port because it comes into the computer, or it would have to be an RGB camera that's stored internally to itself. And Okay, we got one more question. Actually, I got a couple more over here. The Esri Geodobase export option does not allow us to export our targets currently. That's in our roadmap for the next couple of months to be able to export targets and planned lines and some other things just as easily by right click and say export to Geodatabase. It's a different, because we're dealing with the uh, point data that we're exporting, we export to a certain format. We're adding in all of the other standard high pack methods to be able to export matrix files as a raster image, to export targets as point objects, to export planned lines as line work, all of that will be integrated over the course of the next year. And how long does it take to charge the payload? It takes about an hour to two hours to charge it. So you get a couple hours of use and a couple hours of charging. Processing a survey, LiDAR data is a lot cleaner than some of the older multibeams, and, and nowadays some multibeams are pretty clean. But LiDAR data takes, I believe, about half as much time to process as multibeam. Do you patch test every project like a multibeam? I do not. You'll notice when you're in uh, the collecting and editing the data whether or not you've got good or bad data. So if you notice that something's wrong, the fact that everything's integral to the payload, it's built into one box. I can take it off of a truck. I can put it on a drone without changing the calibration values. The vehicle it's mounted on doesn't affect the calibration. Um, and here we have a couple more just came in. In this case, the SBG and modem and RTK connections correct directly to the computer, yes. So the SBG is connected to the computer. The modem connects to the computer and we pass the RTK corrections from the USB port through the computer into the SBG. We've tested it and we haven't seen any latency that's caused any error in our RTK corrections. Are all 16 beams on the Velodyne the same beam width or does the beam width increase as you depart from the center of two beams? It does not change. My understanding is it's the same beam width on all of them. All 16 beams go out at the same Millerad. Um, so they do not change. There's not more accuracy at center than there is in the outer beams. All of them have the same beam footprint. Now, when you take a beam and put it at a 15 degree forward and rotate that beam, you might get a bigger footprint in the direction, or not a beam footprint. You'd get a your correct your connection or your <coughs> your detection window doesn't change. Um, how the antenna was attached to the mast. I imagine you're asking about the radio on the payload. The payload itself, um, we intended the antenna was correct connected with a 90 degree screw terminal. What format of plan lines will HIPAC can take for the drone? Right now we can do mission planner. We can do a couple other ones. Um, 
depending on your drone, which ones they'll take in. DJI doesn't import mission planner files, but if you're using one of the um, PixHawk controlled drones, you can export planned lines directly from HiPack, and we have a way to actually export individual lines or one long line with turns in it. And I think that's the last question. All right, thank you so much, Jerry. Um, so everyone, we are unfortunately out of time, so we're gonna wrap this up. We wanna thank you all for your participation and we hope you enjoyed the webinar today. We will get in touch with anyone who had on answered questions over the next week. And I know a few of you had questions on whether this was going to be um, recorded and given to you after. And yes, we will be sending out an email probably next week with the recording to the webinar and possibly some other content that you'll be able to read about. Um, so please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we can be reached at sales at highpack.com. And don't forget to check us out on Instagram and Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn for more upcoming news and updates. So we hope to talk to you soon and have a great rest of your day.